Hello and welcome to Chicago Reacts, Americans Learn. My name is Colin and today I'm watching Napoleon's Revenge. Wagram, what? Wagram? Wait. Wagram, 1809. That should be an easy one for me to pronounce, but uh, I don't know. You should have given up your, <laughs> your hopes on me long ago if you've uh, been watching from the beginning here. Uh, Wagram. I'm going to go with Wagram. <laughs> Uh, this is, of course, from Epic History TV, and uh, we're a few videos in, so uh, if you haven't seen any of the other uh, reactions I've done to the previous videos, go search the channel for, for those and uh, come back, I guess, because it's all chronological, so um, yeah. Um, alrighty, so I don't know, let's get right into it then. Um, be sure to like, share, and subscribe first before I get started. Give you a second to do that. Okay. I think that's long enough. All right, uh, let's get into it here. Cam display and display. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. In May 1809, the Austrians had defeated Napoleon's army in the bloody Battle of Aspern. His enemies took heart. After years of French military dominance, it seemed the tide was turning at last. Three weeks later, Pope <laughs> Pius VII excommunicated Napoleon for annexing papal land. Another propaganda coup for his enemies. But in the wake of its victory, Austria hesitated, not sure whether to seek peace or continue the war. While Napoleon responded with a hurricane of activity. He summoned reinforcements to join him near Vienna. The army of Italy under his stepson Eugène de Beauharnais, and 11th Corps under Marshal Marmont, who had together driven Archduke John's Austrian army out of North Italy, as well as Marshal Bernadotte's Saxon 9th Corps. Napoleon's army grew from 90,000 to a massive 164,000 men and hmm. 544 guns. I wonder how many of those were uh, volunteers. Uh, I don't know. Given this time period, probably not likely, right? I don't want to assume anything. I really don't know that much, but I assume <laughs> they were forced into it. I don't know. P please correct me down in the comments if, if I'm wrong. To take on Charles's army of 128,000 and 414 guns. Six weeks after his first attempt had ended in defeat, Napoleon ordered his army to cross the river once more. This time, his engineers had built solid bridges across the Danube to ensure there was no repeat of the disasters of Aspern. For the French army, Napoleon declared, the Danube no longer exists. So, is that like a more permanent bridge then? Um, does this one still exist? Because I know, like, before, they seemed pretty temporary and were <laughs> being bombarded with barges and, and whatnot. Um, so, I don't know, someone let me know if, if this uh, particular bridge at... I don't know if this is the one they're talking about in the painting. I would guess so. But anyway, yeah, let me know if the, if the bridge still exists, if you know. The stage was set for the largest battle yet seen in European history. If you think our Napoleon series has made you a master of tactics and strategy, put your skills to the test in Vikings War of Clans, generous sponsors of this video. Napoleon's rules of concentration of force and decisive action will serve you well as you battle for dominance alongside up to three million other users in a single event. This is highly addictive military and resource-based mayhem that caters for many styles of play. Build yourself a medieval Maginot line and await enemy assault. Or play like Napoleon and launch your own Berserker Blitzkrieg before the enemy knows you're coming. Use the link in the video description to download Vikings for free. Support the channel and get a special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield that may just save your life. Is this for your phone? Thanks again to Vikings War of Clans yep. for supporting this there video. You go. Or tablet, I guess. <laughs> oh my god. Knocked off by a cannonball, Jesus. On the evening of the 4th of July, in heavy rain, the French began crossing... Also, wait, what did that helmet look like? If it, if the cannonball could take off the helmet without <laughs> taking off the guy's head, like... I get... What, were those, like, 
tallish hats. Was that considered a helmet back then? Were they more than just like felt or whatever they made hats from back then during those, that period? The island of Lobau, not towards the devastated villages of Aspern and Essling, but east towards Gross Enzersdorf, which was soon ablaze from French shells. Archduke Charles had left only a small advance guard to delay the French. By dawn, General Massena's 4th Corps and Oudinot's 2nd Corps were driving those troops back, winning space for the French army to deploy. At 1pm, Napoleon was ready to begin his advance across six miles of flat cornfields towards the main Austrian position, an escarpment known as the Wagram, 100 metres behind the Rusbach stream. As General Lasalle's light cavalry and Massena's 4th Corps swung left to guard the flank, Oudinot's 2nd Corps and Davout's 3rd Corps advanced towards the Wagram. Bernadotte's Saxon Corps and Eugène's Army of Italy filled the centre. At 6pm, unsure of the enemy's strength, Napoleon ordered a full-scale assault against the Wagram Plateau. But his troops met determined Austrian resistance along the line. By dusk, the Saxon 9th Corps had pushed into the village of Deutsch Wagram. The Saxon infantry wore white uniforms, like the Austrians, and as darkness fell, were mistaken for the enemy and fired on by friendly units. Right, right. The Saxons panicked and fled with heavy losses. Napoleon's attempt at a quick breakthrough had failed. That night, both armies slept in the open, while Charles and Napoleon planned their next moves. Man, what a what a, a or or sad way to to lose soldiers by just a poor uh, <laughs> clothing design. Um, hmm. I assume that probably happened somewhat frequently back in the day, because otherwise it's not like they were telling each other, "Hey, we're gonna be wearing this color this day, so make sure you're wearing some other color so we don't get confused," right? So. I assume they had to design their uniforms uh, as they were encountering the the enemy, right? So, I, with the uniforms, they were probably changing as the war progressed, right? Because I think I remember when I was in elementary school, I did um, a project on the designing of the uniforms during the Civil War, and uh, I think there was there was some. Uh, friendly fire amongst certain ranks of the troops that like the lower ranks had pretty similar colored uh uniforms on both sides i guess like they're gray i think if i remember correctly this is a long a long long time ago when i when i did this project uh that's probably like 20 years ago um so forgive me my memory's a little fuzzy um but yeah i would imagine in this case as well that the uniforms are probably being adapted as uh the years went on to avoid situations like this. Man. Would they fire the guy that designed those uniforms in, in a situation like that? Or they, you know, I don't know. How tough on, on the uh, uniform designers were they back in the day? <laughs> on the second day, Napoleon planned for Davout's Third Corps to lead the attack, rolling up the Austrian flank, while his other corps pinned down the enemy with local attacks. But to the Emperor's fury, he learned that overnight, without orders, Marshal Bernadotte had withdrawn his battered Saxons from Adakla, which the Austrians now occupied. Adakla was a crucial strongpoint in the centre of the battlefield, Napoleon gave orders for its immediate recapture. But the French and Saxon attack failed, with heavy losses. The Austrians had their own problems. Archduke Charles, knowing he faced a superior enemy, had decided his only chance of victory lay in an all-out dawn attack. 
He was relying on his brother, Archduke John, reaching him with 13,000 reinforcements, in time to support the attack on the left. But by dawn, there was still no sign of him. What's more, as 4th Corps began its assault on Grosshofen, on time, 3rd Corps, which had received its orders late, was still getting into position, holding up the entire Austrian right wing. Charles had to tell 4th Corps to abort its unsupported attack, until the other corps were ready. With the Austrians paralysed by delays, at 10am, Davout began his attack. A fierce infantry battle erupted in the village of Markgraf Neusiedl, while in the fields, dragoons and hussars fought a giant, whirling cavalry battle, as each side tried to outflank the other. Davout's corps took the village, though they couldn't stop the Austrians withdrawing to a strong new position on the Wagram escarpment. Meanwhile, a serious threat had developed to Napoleon's left flank and rear. Klinau's 6th Corps had driven back the outnumbered French, with some units advancing as far as Essling, dangerously close to Napoleon's vital river crossings. Napoleon urgently needed to reinforce his left flank, but he was also determined to hold back his reserves for a decisive attack. So he ordered Massena's 4th Corps to march across the battlefield and reinforce the left. A huge redeployment like this, right in front of the enemy, was high risk. So Marshal Bessier was ordered to lead a cavalry attack straight against the enemy centre. Casualties were high. Even Marshal Bessier had his horse killed under him to the alarm of his men. Hmm. But the enemy was kept busy while 4th Corps completed its redeployment and forced Klinau's corps to fall back. Oh my god. Dang. <laughs> Any trooper who isn't dead by 30 is a coward, and I don't anticipate exceeding that length of time. I had at age 33. Well, General Antoine Lasalle. Napoleon now assembled a grand battery of more than 80 cannon in the centre of the battlefield. This was one of Napoleon's trademark tactics, a concentration of artillery to blast the enemy line and pave the way for a decisive French attack. The grand battery fired an estimated 15,000 rounds, setting light to the cornfields. Around 1pm, Napoleon ordered a general attack. As Davout continued to batter at the enemy flank, 4th Corps would advance on the left, 2nd Corps on the right, while in the centre, General Macdonald would lead forward 8,000 men of the Army of Italy, formed up in a giant three-sided square to secure his flanks. But despite the terrible French cannonade, Austrian 3rd Corps and Grenadiers of the Reserve met the French advance with torrential fire. Macdonald's giant square was cut to pieces, its men mowed down en masse by cannon fire, and the attack stalled. But the Austrian army, battered by relentless French attacks, was near breaking point. Mm. Every part of the line was under pressure from the French. Archduke Charles, determined above all to keep his army intact, ordered a retreat. The Austrian withdrawal was disciplined and well executed. Napoleon had his victory. But his army was also so shattered by fatigue and heavy losses, it was unable to launch any effective pursuit.
jury. Wow. I wonder, oh man, how the war may have turned out if, if, uh, who was it, um, that gave the, uh, order for surrender, was it? Consulted his older time and asked for a ceasefire. Let's go back. Nine. Yes. Sorry. Charles. As the fighting escalated. Okay. Charles knew yeah. he could not withstand the French a second time and asked for a ceasefire. <sighs> yeah, I mean, that's that's tough if you didn't know that the British were coming. <laughs> that's a funny thing to, to say in a positive light as an American. <laughs> the British are coming. Um, no, but yeah, I wonder how the, the war may have turned out if, if he hadn't given the uh, surrender at that point. Um, hmm. oh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, so the British do land. Uh, but what effect do they have, uh, now that this guy, Charles, has surrendered? Let's see. But he had not consulted his older brother, Emperor Francis, who was furious when he heard the news. Not least because long-awaited British support was finally on the way. Three weeks after the Battle of Znaim, the largest amphibious force Britain had ever assembled 35 ships of the line and 39,000 troops hmm. landed at Volcheron Island on the Scheldt estuary. Its aim was to destroy French shipping and naval stores. But following the successful bombardment and capture of Vlissingen, British commanders let the initiative slip from their grasp. Their force was bottled up by French troops on the marshy Dutch coast where it was decimated by fever and dysentery. Hmm. About so maybe, 4,000 died. Maybe it wouldn't have helped much in that case. Hmm. Interesting. Still makes you wonder, though. I don't know. It's the whole, like, butterfly effect thing. Just to... I don't know. Can't really escape a disease, though, I guess. <laughs> in this case. I don't know. Many more became permanent invalids. En Espanol, thanks to History March for creating the battle map for this video, and to all our Patreon supporters whose generosity made this video possible. Already. Oops. I don't know if you guys could pick that up, but that was the next video playing, but we're not ready for that one yet. So that'll be later. Hang on a second. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties there, but uh, thanks for uh, sticking around if you're still here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that uh, last video. Uh, so, you know, uh, we already saw a video that was titled uh, Napoleon Defeated, and I thought that that was going to be the end of it, but uh, it looks like we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. So, 
uh, yeah, coming to the end, close to the end of the line, I guess. We'll see. Uh, I don't know just how many videos are left at this point. I haven't quite looked ahead, um, but I know there's at least two or three more. Um, but yeah, so if you want to make sure that you uh, catch the last few videos, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Yeah, you know, it's a good way to get notified for uh, new videos that come out. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, until next time. Uh, I don't know. I'll. Have a good one. I'll see you next time. <laughs>